Uh, thank you for the invitation to speak today. Uh, what I hope to do is give you an oversight into some of the most recent work that we've been doing on the pathogen Rift Valley fever virus. And hopefully I can convince you that it's an, it is an important um, emerging agricultural and human pathogen. Um, so as Dr. Towner mentioned, I'm at the Center for Vaccine Research um, here at the University of Pittsburgh. And Rift Valley fever is uh, a multifaceted zoonotic disease. And for these reasons, I find it to be incredibly fascinating. Um, it's found endemically throughout many regions in Africa. Um, it has also uh, spread into Egypt, Saudi Arabia, um, Madagascar. Um, so it's found um, in quite a large area of the world and it's a bunya virus. It's uh, transmitted by mosquitoes. Um, what it does is cause a lethal disease in domesticated livestock, and as a result, it causes a severe uh, socioeconomic impacts in the affected re regions. It's considered a select agent by the USDA and Federal Select Agent Program, and so we work with that in a um, select agent BSL-3 facility. It's also a notifiable disease, um, according to the OIE, or the World Organization for Animal Health. So it's considered a significant health threat. And um, what it does in livestock animals, it causes an acute disease um, that has somewhat of an age-dependent mortality. So younger animals are more susceptible to lethal disease, although adults are also quite susceptible. And they develop acute disease um, that often comes on with very little warning. Um, and one of the uh, biggest characteristics of Rift Valley fever infection in animals is the fact that pregnant animals will abort their fetuses at quite high rate. So sheep can um, suffer 80 to 90 percent fetal loss uh, during um, animal um, uh, uh, infections where cows have slightly less, but goats, camels, um, and other livestock can also suffer abortion. So this is a major hallmark of Rift Valley fever um, epidemics is the ab abortions. In people, we see somewhat of a different clinical outcome. So most humans infected with Rift Valley fever develop non-lethal disease that can be um, pretty severe, dengue-like with uh, joint pain, high fever, body aches, but it's generally non-lethal. In a small percentage of people, they can go on to develop more severe clinical complications, um, ocular disease being the most common, um, but uh, people can also develop severe hepatic or hemorrhagic disease, as well as encephalitis. And so my lab over the past several years has been studying some of these um, lesser well-known outcomes of uh, Rift Valley fever infection. And we've been using animal models to study things like encephalitis. Uh, we've also spent a lot of time trying to, um, to design and test vaccines and therapeutics in our animal models. But one of the uh, open questions has been, given what we know happens in livestock with the high rate of spontaneous fetal abortions, um, is there vertical transmission in pregnant women? So is Rift Valley fever infection a threat to pregnant women? And what can we learn about that? Um, as you could imagine, given the effect that Rift Valley fever has in livestock, as well as that in people, uh, vaccines have been a major way that, uh, that animal infections with Rift Valley fever have been controlled. And so the history of vaccinations with Rift is actually very interesting. It goes back all the way to the 1940s. So vaccines and specifically live attenuated vaccines have been used for many, many years to control the spread of Rift Valley fever in animals. And it also has the effect of limiting the spread to people. Uh, the main problem with uh, live attenuated vaccines in animals is that there's a high rate of vertical transmission of the live attenuated strains themselves, which sort of defeats the purpose of vaccinating animals. And so clearly based on the livestock information that we know, uh, fetal infection in pregnant animals occurs at a high rate. And so we wanted to understand, uh, you know, what is the threat to pregnant women and how can we study this in, in the laboratory? So I'm gonna to talk today about, give you an overview of three different approaches that we've been using over the past few years to understand the role of Rift Valley fever in pregnancy. And the first one I'll talk about is what is the actual likelihood of vertical transmission occurring in pregnant women? Then I'll talk about some comparative studies um, looking at placental infection across different animal species. 
And then finally, I will, I will talk briefly about our rodent model of congenital infection. And so if we look back at the literature on what, what do we actually know about um, vertical transmission in humans, in pregnant women infected with Rift Valley fever. Uh, and what we know is not very much. So early uh, studies showed no association between women who had a history of, of Rift infection based on um, IgG positivity uh, and miscarriages. But these early studies really didn't look at women who were infected during pregnancy. More recently, um, shown on the right-hand uh, side of this slide, uh, there have been isolated cases of vertical transmission that have occurred in pregnant women towards the end of their pregnancy, so about 35 or 36 weeks. And these babies were born very, very sick. The mothers were sick and they had confirmed rift infection. There was an, um, a cross-sectional study done in, uh, during the Sudan outbreak in 2011-2012 um, that looked at 150 or so cases of women who had documented Rift Valley fever infection during pregnancy and found that they had a much higher rate of miscarriage, 54% compared to women who um, did not have documented Rift infection. And so most of these miscarriages are actually late term uh, fetal losses or stillbirths. So even though the um, epidemiological data uh, is lacking that is suggestive that uh, pregnant women can be affected um, and their, their fetuses can be affected uh, by rift infection during pregnancy. And so we wanted to address this experimentally and we um, collaborated with um, uh, our uh, friend and collaborator, Dr. Carolyn Coyne, who had been performing um, uh, lots of experiments studying the human placenta at various stages of gestation and studying its susceptibility to viral infection. Um, and so what we did is we collaborated with her and we were able to obtain um, second trimester placental explants of three different regions of the uh, human placenta. Uh, the area shown here in the green box um, is the chorionic villi. These are the branched tree-like structures which form um, the actual uh, barrier between the maternal and fetal blood. Um, we also obtained samples of the decidua, which is a maternal tissue, and the fetal membranes. And so we can um, generate explants that look like this, place them in culture, infect them with Rift Valley fever virus, and um, look at viral growth over time. Uh, and what we found was that all three um, uh, types of tissues were susceptible to Rift infection, and uh, Rift grew in these explants in a dose-dependent manner through 48 hours post-infection. And so this is suggestive that at least these, the, the cells in these explants are susceptible to infection. And when we look um, more closely at the explant cultures, um, and if we take a zoomed in view of one of the chorionic villi, which are those tree-like structures, which form uh, the, the actual boundary between maternal and fetal blood, we can see that they have a very unique and interesting structure. So the blue um, areas on this tree are fused cells called syncytiotrophoblasts. These are multinucleated cells and uh, they are highly resistant to infection by a variety of pathogens, including all of the classic torch pathogens like Listeria, Toxoplasma, Zika, CMV. These pathogens cannot infect the uh, blue syncytiotrophoblasts. Instead, they infect other cells of the placenta called extravillus trophoblasts. Um, uh, so these syncytial trophoblasts are highly resistant to infect, uh, infection by pathogens. But what we found was that uh, Rift Valley fever virus could infect the syncytial trophoblasts. This is this key interface. They're highly resistant to all known pathogens except Rift Valley fever can infect them. Uh, so that suggests to us that the human placenta could be highly susceptible to uh, infection by this virus. Um, and I just wanna highlight that Zika and the other torch pathogens can't infect these cells. Okay, so I just told you uh, about the likelihood of vertical transmission occurring in pregnant women through um, our work with placental explants. And so uh, we were in a period where we were unable to obtain placental explants anymore due to the fetal tissue ban. And so we decided to do some comparative studies with placental explants from livestock because um, our thinking was that 
All right, if we know that, that fetal infection in livestock occurs at a very high rate, um, and we see based on our uh, human explant studies that human placental explants are susceptible, how do they compare to each other? And can we draw some inferences based on these comparisons? So um, we set out to, to, to obtain some placental uh, tissue from livestock species. And this was all driven by a postdoc in my lab, Cindy McMillan, uh, who initiated um, and really was the driver behind these studies. Uh, and so we uh, have full term placental tissue from women, from humans, from our women's hospital, as well as from cows and sheep from a couple of farms um, in the Pittsburgh area. And so um, obtaining these placenta is always an interesting process, um, but we're able to get them and bring them back to the lab. And um, if you're familiar with the structure of placenta, human and livestock placental structures are very, very different. So humans have what's called a discoidal structure with um, the uh, villus trees, like I was talking about earlier, whereas livestock have um, a cotyledonary structure. So under uh, in the placenta, they have looks like these little knobs here. These are actually um, tiny placentomes, which you can kind of think of as mini placenta. Um, and these are the sites of um, blood exchange between uh, maternal and fetal tissues. But we are able to take the livestock um, tissue and dissect it up, kind of like we did for the humans. So this picture just illustrates how we do the dissection. Um, these are, this is a picture of formalin fixed sheet placenta uh, with the cotyledons and the membranes that we can dissect. And when we do this on live tissue, we can get nice explants that can be uh, infected ex vivo. So we do this in a similar way to what we did to the humans. Uh, what we found was that the virus can infect uh, sheep tissue, all types very, very well. And the virus we're using for all of our studies is the pathogenic ZH501 strain. So the virus replicates really well in sheep. We can visualize that with um, uh, fluorescence, um, uh, immunohistochemistry and microscopy. And so when we do this for both sheep and cattle and kind of compare across species, um, this is just gives you an oversight of the different tissues that we can obtain from each of the species uh, and the different placental types across the bottom. We can see that Rift Valley fever replicates really, really well in sheep placental tissue. Um, cows are more intermediate and humans are lower, although the virus does replicate in them. So this basically reflects what is known in nature, that sheep are really susceptible and humans seem to be less so. Um, okay, so I gave you an overview of our human studies, our comparative uh, studies in livestock. Um, and now I want to end with talking briefly about how we've developed a rodent model, because there's, uh, uh, limitations with what we can do with both the human and the livestock explants. And so we wanted a more tractable rodent model with which we could ask some more interesting experimental questions. So for this, we use uh, Sprague Dolly rats as a late gestation model. And our Sprague Dolly rat model is set up um, according to this diagram. So the gestational period in rats is about 22 days. The placenta forms around um, embryonic day nine to 11. And we're infecting the rats after the placenta is formed. So this is, a late, this is why it's a late gestation model. We infect them at E14. They get subcutaneously infected with ZH501. Um, and then we monitor the animals. Um, and the, the normal delivery date is E22. Um, and we take them out to about 18 days post-infection if they survive that long. So the normal delivery date is eight days post uh, infection with Rift Valley fever. And what we find is that sort of depending on the dose that we give um, the, the pregnant dams, we have about 50% of the, the pregnant moms will succumb to disease within the first week. So between about two or six days post infection, the moms will succumb to lethal hepatic disease. Um, this is a typical uh, result of Rift infection in rodents. About the other half of the animals will go on to survive. They'll deliver their pups and they'll live out to the end of the study. So when we look in these two populations, the surviving uh, dams, which um, have no signs of disease at all, so they remain completely healthy, 
versus the dams that succumb to lethal disease here. Um, if we look first at what's happening in these animals that succumb to lethal disease, we can take the placentas from these animals as they are euthanized, and we find very high levels of virus in their placental tissue. These are results from a plaque assay, so this is infectious viral load. So we even had one animal that was euthanized at two days post-infection and had um, 10 to the seventh um, PFU of live virus in their placental tissue. So I don't think anybody had really recognized the placenta as being such a target for rift infection um, up to this point. And so, as you would imagine, the pups that came from all of these um, dams that succumbed to disease, they had a lot of viral RNA and infectious virus within, um, within their abdominal cavities. So uh, this graph represents um, viral RNA levels within the viscera of pups that came from lethally infected dams. So even pups from that dam that died at two days post-infection had a lot of viral RNA, um, as well as the ones that uh, succumbed at later days. Okay, so the virus is clearly transmitted. It clearly infects the placenta and goes straight into the pups. Um, the most interesting thing we found was, however, with the pregnant dams that had no clinical signs of disease and survived and went on to deliver their pups, um, what we found was that um, the majority of pups born from those dams were either born deceased, which is shown here by the um, red uh, symbol at day zero, or they died within the first two days after delivery. Some of the pups did survive, and even the ones that survived had viral RNA within them. So in the subclinical or normal appearing dams, uh, the fetuses and the pups are getting infected and they're succumbing um, in utero. And so um, our, we found that a significantly reduced survival rate of pups from infected and uh, subclinical dams uh, compared to our uninfected controls. And so just to kind of uh, visually illustrate that, here are some pictures of, these are all pups that were born to subclinically infected dams. So the moms appeared normal, did not have fever, did not really have weight loss, um, looked completely fine, went to the normal delivery date and then delivered deceased, deceased pups. So these are all deceased pups from one dam. Um, here's a mixture of deceased and live pups born from another dam. So uh, a dam was able to give birth to both live and dead pups within the same litter. And then these are pups that were delivered to a healthy dam who died during the birthing process with some pups remaining in utero. Uh, and what you can see just by looking at these is that it seems like development stops at different stages of gestation despite coming from the same dam. Um, and we were able to, to find dams that gave birth to both live and dead pups. And regardless, almost all the pups had viral RNA. So the virus was very easily transmitted in utero to the developing, developing pups. Um, we've done a lot of work recently looking at the pathology, um, both in the pups and in the dams. And I only have time to, to show you one uh, brief illustration of that. But what we are seeing in the placental tissue itself is that the virus is causing a tremendous amount of hemorrhage, both in lethally infected dams, as well as in the surviving subclinical dams. The placenta are very, very damaged and have a lot of extra um, uh, hemorrhage as well as necrosis within the tissue. So I kind of gave you an overview of three different aspects that we are working on when studying Rift Valley fever infection during pregnancy. And, um, you know, hopefully I've convinced you that this is an important aspect of viral pathogenesis of this emerging virus that we need to study more of. And clearly um, we don't have um, all of the information yet. But one of the things that we really wanna do is look at the comparative mechanisms of vertical transmission. So if we know that Rift Valley fever is very easily transmitted in livestock like sheep, and we know it can happen easily in rodents like rats, we suspect it can happen in people, there has to be some common mechanism of transmission given the fact that the placental structure from all of those species is very, very different. So we are actively studying what are these mechanisms of vertical transmission? Does it have to do with some sort of common receptor or attachment factor or uh, something that makes uh, placental tissue highly tropic for infection? 
Um, and then the other more sort of applied approach is we are actively involved in vaccine and therapeutic research. Uh, we believe that the Sprague Dolly rat model that we have can be a great um, early screening tool for vaccines and therapeutics. So can we design vaccines and therapeutics that will protect uh, fetuses and pregnant animals? Can we use that to identify maternal immune correlates of protection so that we understand better um, what it takes to protect pregnant animals? Um, I mentioned earlier the live attenuated vaccines that are, are still used um, uh, during rift outbreaks. A lot of those have known um, adverse effects in pregnant animals. So can we use these vaccine strains to understand, to help us understand what is this mechanism of vertical transmission in the rat model? Um, and so I just kind of like to end with a take home message um, that Rift Valley fever is a really important, we feel an important emerging viral disease. We've seen what's happened with SARS-CoV-2. Um, and so we need to study emerging uh, viral diseases of all sorts. Uh, because Rift Valley fever is a mosquito transmitted virus and the mosquitoes that are competent for it are found throughout a lot of the world. Um, we fear that climate change um, can alter habitats and may change where Rift Valley fever and other similar diseases are found. And so it's a concern for not just the health of people, but the health of animals, the livestock industry. And um, based on all measurements that we can see, including the rodent studies, the human explant studies, um, we believe that uh, infection of pregnant women with Rift Valley fever would be worse than Zika. Um, it's uh, everything points towards a worse clinical outcome for pregnant mothers and their fetuses than what we saw uh, with the Zika outbreak um, of a few years ago. Um, so with that, I would like to thank a lot of people. This was a huge collaborative effort between both current and former members of my lab over the past few years. Um, our collaborator, Carolyn Coyne, well, with the human placental studies. We've worked with some great um, uh, perinatal pathologists um, and my collaborators on other studies. And here we are over the summer, um, socializing outside, masked and distanced, of course, and then our, um, our lab meeting over Zoom. Um, so with that, I will take any questions that you might have. Thank you very much. Great, really nice presentation, Amy. Um, I guess while folks uh, type type in their questions, I guess I got a I got a couple written down here. Um, I, I guess one of them is uh, I guess you sprayed all the rats. I mean, what other rat uh, strains have you have you tried? Have you worked with? That's a good question. Um, I mean, a lot of our other work, our work on encephalitis, is done in the Lewis. Uh, strain of rat. But for the pregnancy studies, we've stuck with Sprague Dolly for a couple of practical reasons. Well, for, first of all, Sprague Dolly rats are sort of the preferred rodent model for embryogenesis and toxicology studies. Um, and so compared to mice, um, rats tend to be used more um, for studying embryogenesis. Um, the practical reason is that we're able to obtain timed pregnant Sprague Dolly rats um, at reason relatively reasonable costs compared to some of the other strains. But we would like to address that question of, you know, do we see a different outcome in other, other strains of rat or even mice as well? Right. Um, I have a question here uh, about vertical transmission of or not of a live attenuated vaccine. Um, mm -hmm. Is there, are there any of the vaccines that offer protection uh, to the, vac to the um, developing fetus in Euro? Um, in law is the question about livestock. So, uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Some of, so a number of vac live attenuated vaccine strains like the Smith burn and the clone 13, uh, in experimental livestock studies, it's been shown that, um, while they provide protection for adult animals, the vaccine strain can be transmitted to the fetuses and can cause, uh, fetal death or, uh, deformities. So we definitely know in livestock, yes, the vaccines work, but it has this bad side effect, I think because the virus is so tropic for placental tissue that it's really hard to prevent um, that infection. Uh, we really don't know anything about humans, um, about whether uh, the current vaccines in humans would, would protect fetuses. And that's one of the things that we, that we think is important to study. Right. Um, have another question here. Um, let me see here. Um, 
Yeah, I've raised a bit. Uh, the difference is to explain Rift uh, ability to infect the syncytial trophoblasts uh, compared to similar viruses like Zika. I mean, I guess in your slide, you had the Zika didn't right. infect it, but I got obviously Zika gets through. Maybe talk about the differences. Yeah, the so, so Zika, the, uh, the way our collaborator Carolyn Coyne describes it is Zika takes the side roads um, through the placenta because this syncytial trophoblast layer is so resistant. These other pathogens have to go around that. Rift seems to be able to go directly through those cells. Mm -hmm. So um, we would love to identify what the difference is between Rift and the other pathogens, and we're working on that. Um, we have been somewhat limited in being able to obtain human placental tissue um, at this time, so um, we hope to kind of restart those studies again soon. Great. Um, let me see here. Well, one more, maybe one last question. Here we've got you know, two minutes. Um, uh, I guess why uh, why sheep? Like, why are they so much more susceptible? It seems like than or more susceptible than other livestock. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, we that is a really great question. Uh, we don't know. They seem to be the most susceptible of all, uh, even compared to cows, compared to goats and camels. Sheep are the most, and we really have no idea why. Um, so remarkably little has been done studying this phenomena in both livestock and humans. Um, it's been known for years that this happens, but uh, most of the focus has, has been on vaccinating um, livestock to stop, um, to stop epizootics and very little has been done to study the mechanism of vertical transmission, even in the livestock. Right. I mean, I guess one more quick question that came in here that's related. Uh, have you considered guinea pigs um, as they have anatomically similar placenta to human? Yeah, for sure. Uh, we have definitely considered guinea pigs and we'd love to move into that area. Um, it's just like kind of getting getting our ducks in a row to, to do that. Um, yeah, it, we're working towards that though. Right, great. All right, thanks. Well, great, great talk. Um, I think we'll go ahead and push forward to our next speaker. Um, our next speaker uh, is Dr. Dennis Bente. Um, he's at the uh, Galveston National Laboratory, University of Texas Medical Branch in Galveston. And uh, he's gonna be talking to us uh, about the role of the veterinarians play in fighting tick-borne hemorrhagic fever viruses. So uh, on to you, Dennis. Turn on my camera and my microphone and you can see my slides, correct? Yep, we can see them. Okay, excellent. So I want to thank the organizers for the invitation and the, the opportunity to uh, present at the symposium. I've been working on arthropod borne viruses for almost 20 years and on hemorrhagic fever viruses at BSL-4 for almost 15 years. And I wanted to give you my perspective of what research is necessary to find sustainable solutions to um, to prevent not only the expansion of tick-borne hemorrhagic fever viruses and their tick vectors into new areas, but also stop the increase in human case numbers that we've seen gone up in the, in the last two decades. So if you're familiar with uh, tick-borne viruses that cause disease in humans, they're almost always not a health concern for livestock that maintain the, the ticks. Uh, an exception is, is Laoping ill here. In my talk here, I, what I wanted to, to do is I wanted to make the case that we as veterinarians are crucial in understanding the disease dynamics in the uh, enzootic cycle that spills over into humans, and that we also crucial in creating sustainable long-term countermeasures. My lab studies the uh, transmission and pathogenesis of tick-borne hemorrhagic fever viruses at the Galveston National Lab. Uh, and our special focus is Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever virus. So if you look at um, the uh, BSL-4 viruses that we study, almost a third of them are actually transmitted by ticks. Uh, you see them here. So in addition to CCHF uh, virus, we have Alcumara hemorrhagic fever virus, Kaisano forest disease virus, OMSC hemorrhagic fever virus. And you see the distribution here on, on the right side. The good news for us is they're only found in the the Eastern Hemisphere, and uh, typically they're very uh, focal, but we've seen an expansion and we've also seen new discoveries or discoveries of new hemorrhagic fever viruses uh, closely related to CCHF in, in China and, and also another one here recently last year in, 
in Japan. So the, the list is really expanding and we're thinking that this is really just the tip of the iceberg in terms of the, the virus distribution. And we probably will also see a, a further expansion of, of those viruses. So historically, um, the research focus on tick-borne hemorrhagic fever viruses has been mostly on the molecular aspects of the virus, the genome and certain um, uh, viral determinants of, of, uh, of virulence, but not very much on the tick vector. And so very little is known about what happens in the tick vector and what happens during transmission from the tick to the host and then back from the host to the, the tick. So my laboratory is trying to change this. We are currently the only BSL-4 lab in the world that works with live ticks at BSL-4. And we use a range of different uh, native and non-native uh, tick species to look at uh, uh, vector competence. So for example, study the vector competence of North American ticks for, um, for these hemorrhagic fever viruses. And uh, we also use a range of animal models. So typically we use mice, but we also use rabbits. And we just got the approval uh, to also work with uh, goats in, in our BSL-4 lab to really accurately um, uh, mimic the, the uh, transmission or the, uh, the transmission of the, the tick to uh, some of those livestock species. Um, my lab has been very interested in the last two years to focus more on reservoir targeted uh, countermeasures. So combining, for example, anti-tick vaccines with anti-pathogen um, vaccines uh, and delivering them to wildlife or to domestic animals. As mentioned earlier, historically, the focus of tick-borne hemorrhagic fever viruses uh, because of the nature of BSL-4 has been and, and the disease in humans, you know, these cause very severe, often fatal hemorrhagic uh, syndromes in, in humans with high fatality rates of maybe up to 30%. The focus has been very much on the pathogenesis of the human disease. And there's no, no disease in, in any of the other animals that get infected. So it makes sense to really understand why, or trying to understand why the disease only occurs in humans. So the, what we see here typically in, in uh, the human cases, humans become infected um, mostly through tick bite um, or milk or uh, meat products from livestock. And uh, typically the, the people that are affected are farmers or even veterinarians working with the animals, slaughterhouse workers. And uh, we often see a single case and these cases are then transported to a rural hospital where there's no awareness um, that the um, uh, hemorrhagic fever is circulating or is endemic in the area. And so the proper PPE is not being worn. And then we see a, a cluster of nosocomial infections in, um, in the hospital where uh, healthcare workers get in, infected. What I see is that there's often this misconception that tick-borne hemorrhagic fever virus is just like Ebola. Uh, uh, the, the, uh, the level of human-to-human -human transmission can ramp up. And this then here, the nosocomial cases can turn into an, an epidemic. We've not seen this with those viruses. These viruses have been around for, for a long time. So I think personally, I think this is very unlikely but a, a great focus is uh, currently is being spent on um, preventing that um, a tick-borne hemorrhagic fever virus uh, increases the human-to-human -human transmission. What we see is once the awareness is there that this is a hemorrhagic fever virus and the proper PPE is implemented in the hospital setting, the uh, infections stop and uh, the, there's, there's no more infection, no more clusters. So uh, because the the human cases are typically um, sporadic. Um, we see maybe less than 20 or 30 cases per year in, in a country such as you know, Bulgaria or maybe uh, Kenya, uh, just to give you a couple of, of countries here. And these cases always ha uh, happen in a, in a rural or very remote areas. The big question is, is there enough of return of investment for vaccine companies or uh, companies that develop monoclonals or antivirals to develop these products for humans. 
And so in 2018, the World Health uh, Organization convened a, a roadmaps workshop on CCHF. And one of the discussions that came up is to supplement the, the efforts to develop human countermeasurements with long-term reductions of the enzootic life cycle, which you see here, which would provide a more sustainable solution, which uh, if we focus on, on the reservoir here. So all of the tick-borne viruses circulate in nature in an animal uh, tick uh, cycle. They circulate silently. That means there's no overt signs of disease, either in the ticks or in the animals. So humans will not notice any changes in the animals, and the, but there's still ongoing transmission. So um, it would be nice to, uh, to address the uh, enzootic cycle and, and somehow find ways to stop this. But the problem is there's, there's just very little known about the enzootic cycle. And I think this could really be the main focus of the new NBAF facility to study the enzootic cycle, because we just have a long laundry list of questions that need to be answered. So we think that the virus is, or those viruses are maintained in, in nature indefinitely. Um, there's some evidence for it, but we just don't have enough um, data really to, to prove this. Uh, we think, at least for Crimean Congo, that the ticks are the long-term reservoir and not the animal hosts. This could be different for Kaisano forest or for Kumara virus. We know very little about vector competence. So we know that certain tick genera like uh, hyaloma ticks for CCHF or hemaphysalis for Kaisano forest are really the main vectors, but what other tick species play a role Maybe even if they just play a supplementary role. Uh, we recently discovered um, that uh, we found a cryptic transmission cycle in, in Turkey where CCHF can actually circulate in reptiles and the reptile ticks can, can feed into the main transmission cycle that we see between uh, livestock and wild animals and, and hyaloma ticks. So there's so many other questions. What is the virus transmission efficacy, right? Like how much virus needs to be present in, in the blood of, of a cow in order to have enough ticks infected? What biotic and abiotic factors shape the transmission? And what anthropogenic factors are, play a role? Um, so what we see with, um, with uh, CCHF, for example, um, is that land fragmentation plays a, a great role. The, the style of animal husbandry also influences the, the transmission rate. Um, migration, deforestation play a big role with Kaisano forest in, in India. So, so all of those components play into the transmission, but are very little understood. So much greater effort needs to go into studying the enzootic uh, cycle. So uh, we've seen a really a significant increase in human cases over the last two decades with the tick-borne hemorrhagic fever viruses. And the question always remains is, how can we explain or even predict why the case numbers have gone up over the years? The problem with tick-borne hemorrhagic fever viruses is that from an ecological perspective, they are very complex. They depend on a tight connection between the virus, the tick, the host, and the host and the tick, and then obviously humans get infected through, through the ticks or um, the uh, animals. So what you see here is a, a fictive four-year seasonal cycle of a tick-borne virus and the ticks and the animal hosts that maintain the virus. So here in, in orange, you see this seasonal activity and the tick density of ticks um, here in green, you see the, uh, the animal host density. And then here in red, you see um, the human cases that typically happen here at the peak of tick activity, mostly in the summertime. So what really happens is, how can we predict that really that the case numbers go up? And uh, um, in order to, to understand this, we have to acknowledge that there's a tight relationship here between the animal host that maintains the ticks. So um, this is the animal hosts are connected. So wildlife and domestic animals. 
And then the ticks, also the tick density influences the risk of humans be becoming uh, exposed to tick bite, to a tick bite. So what we've seen with many of the tick-borne uh, hemorrhagic fever viruses, if there's an, an ecological uh, disruption of uh, the balance, that's when we see an increase of human case numbers. So let's say the, um, the domestic animal numbers go up. Um, a good example is with Crimean Congo. Um, in, in Turkey, there was uh, terrorist activities, farming stopped, a lot of the land overgrew. And then when the animals came back in and a lot of wildlife came in, they also, we saw an, an increase of animal, uh, of animal host levels. And this then leads to an increase of the tick density um, being brought in through, through the animals. And if you see a greater tick density, then you also see in the following year, greater level of, of human cases. In terms of anthropogenic factors, we see that climate change will also extend the seasonality, the phenology of, of ticks. So we, we see ticks being more active over a longer period of time, and that obviously increases the risk of uh, the ticks um, um, or humans being exposed to, to ticks. So all of this can then really ramp up and then lead to an increase of human cases over time. A hot topic currently um, in, in our field is can ticks establish in new areas? Are we at a risk of Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever virus in the US? Um, I mentioned earlier, all of those tick-borne viruses, the tick-borne hemorrhagic fever viruses are only found in the Eastern hemisphere. So is there a chance that CCHF or Kaisano Forest or Alcumra will come to the US? Well, there are multiple ways that um, those viruses can spread and viruses and the ticks that carry the virus can spread either through migratory birds. Uh, we see that as the main mechanism for CCHF. So we see that migratory birds here out of Africa will carry um, uh, ticks, hyaloma ticks up into the northern part of uh, uh, Europe here up to uh, Germany and UK. We now even find hyaloma ticks on migratory birds even up to as far up north into uh, Sweden. So this is a clear route of bringing the, the ticks up north and extending the, the distribution of those viruses. Um, animal migration is, is also a very uh, important way of, of bringing infected ticks into new areas. We've seen this here now with Kaisano Forest here where it was typically located here on the, the western uh, central part or uh, western party of India. And now we find through uh, um, migratory uh, domestic animals um, that the range has expanded off of Kaisano forest disease. And then the last option is uh, import and export of, uh, um, of animals. Um, this played a big role of the importation of Alcumra virus here into Saudi Arabia uh, from Eastern Africa. Um, but we see a tremendous amount, as, as you all know, of, of animal import and export. And we do see, um, we do see the, um, uh, the import of, of, of non-native tick species into the US. So you can pull the USDA reports and there's been a, a constant a wave of, um, of ticks coming into the US. So how can, we, um, how can we predict this? One of the, the tools that we have available is, is ecological niche modeling. And this is actually what you see here on the map is what we did here in collaboration with uh, Dr. Estrada Pena in Spain, uh, a veterinarian as, as well, um, where we mimicked or where we modeled the uh, uh, preferred niche of Hyaloma marginatum, the main tick vector that transmits CCHF here in the Mediterranean basin. And you see all the red spots here. So the Mediterranean uh, basin is really an excellent habitat, habitat for, for those ticks. And if you model this, if you look, model the environmental factors, you see that either California here, even certain parts of Texas could, uh, could be a functional niche for um, those ticks. So um, you can imagine that, um, in an ideal setting, if these ticks are imported into uh, the uh, United States, that they have to, they could establish. But many factors have to come uh, to really to fruition in that case for those ticks to establish themselves. And we've not seen 
um, hyaloma ticks in the Americas at this point, although there's a constant um, import, especially through like um, the exotic pet trade and, and so on. So I think there are many questions to be answered, but I think one of the, the big warning signs is the recent discovery of Hemophysalis longicornis, the Asian longhorn tick here in the, the Northeast of the United States. Again, veterinarians were um, crucial here in the discovery of the ticks on, on sheep um, here in, in New Jersey. And um, it's really unclear how the tick made it uh, to the United States, normally only found in, in Southeast Asia and in Australia and how the tick was able to establish in the United States. So um, still an open, an open book with many questions that we need to answer and that we need to model in, um, in an uh, in vivo animal and tick transmission model. So um, I wanna send you off with the, the key message here. What are sustainable solutions to prevent the expansion and the increased incidence of tick-borne hemorrhagic fever viruses? Well, clearly we have to take a one health approach. We need an interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary approach. And I think that veterinarians really should lead the way in that approach. And um, the main focus needs to be on uh, filling the gaps and characterize the enzootic cycle. Um, we definitely need to develop the in vivo transmission models. Um, so um, having livestock, of um, ticks feeding on livestock and characterizing, uh, characterizing transmission rates, characterizing vector competence, co-feeding, so on. The list is, is really long. And then we also have to think in addition to the human countermeasures, we also have to think about reservoir targeted vaccine approaches such as an anti-tick vaccine uh, or something that we can deliver to livestock and, and to wildlife as well. And um, I'm gonna end here, obviously this is, you know, it takes a village to raise a child. I have to thank many, many people, collaborators from CDC, from USAMRIT, um, uh, people in Europe, um, colleagues in Spain, many other people that are involved in this. And um, I wanna thank you for your attention. Great, well, very nice talk, uh, Dennis. Um, I guess I'll just start off with a, uh, with a quick question as well, while other folks sort of type uh, questions in the in the Q and A box, um, I, I guess one question I have is just you know, and I don't know much about the high loma ticks. I presume that there's multiple stages of development. Um, I know that there are for like for soft ticks, for one of the Doris ticks, there are. Um, how does that change the the competency um, of the tick for uh, CCHF? Do you know? Yeah, that's a very good question, and I'm really glad you bring this up, John, because. Um, um, one of the things that I did not talk about is um, that ticks become persistently infected. So an adult acquiring the virus by feeding on a cow can uh, become persistently infected, will transmit the virus trans transovarially to the next generation, then transstadially. Um, I, you know, like with so many questions, uh, I don't know if there's really a difference between um, the different life stages of the species. Um, certainly in the amount of virus that they will uh, in, inject into the, the animal. Um, it's, it's tricky to work with the, the immature life stages. Um, so I'm, you see I'm dancing around that question. Um, but the, the, the point here is really the, uh, or the interesting fact is that the tick will become persistently infected. And we're talking months or years here, right? So what is happening in a tick that carries the virus for two years, right? Like what's, what will happen to, to the virus? Is there a certain type of evolution that will go on in, in the virus? So that's, that's really not clear. M many things that we need to address. Um, great, so I'm looking into the, uh, the Q and A box. Um, there's a question in here about uh, studies uh, looking at the environmental temperature um, of CCHF replication in ticks. I guess you're thinking about the, the dropping off of uh, ticks uh, in northern latitudes and what, what happens then? Yeah, um, there's, there's obviously a, a sweet spot for, for those ticks to establish, right? Like so um, uh, hyaloma ticks that are the main vector really for Crimean Congo, for example, they are thermophilic ticks. They prefer hotter and warmer, warmer climate, uh, drier climate. And we see that changing um, in, in uh, Europe, for example. So the warmer the, the average temperature per year gets, 
the, the more suitable the environment becomes for hyaloma ticks and the more likely it is uh, that these ticks establish. One crucial barrier that we have with tick-borne viruses is, is that the winters typically in, in northern hemispheres are so cold that they will reduce the, the tick numbers of you know, imported ticks, for example, and the ticks will just die off during the winter, at least the thermophilic ticks. Um, but because the winters have become so warm um, with less snow, we see a greater level of, of hyaloma ticks surviving. And this has been shown in, in Germany and in, in the UK and so on, that these hyaloma ticks that have been imported are now actually overwintering and they're surviving the, the winter that supposedly would kill them. Yeah, and I guess I'm just thinking like in South Africa, for example, where there are a fair bit of CCHF, it is reasonably temperate and you can get down to freezing conditions. And so there's um, some level of survivability, I guess it's all on a, on a gradient. Absolutely. And, and um, uh, the, the downside or the flip side of, of the story is uh, certain areas will probably get so hot and so dry that they will not be a suitable environment for ticks anymore. So I think we will not just see a, a, just a broad expansion. I think we will see a shift um, of the tick species further north or south, depending on where you are. So not necessarily just a broad expansion, but more just a shift from one area to a different area. Um, there's a sort of a general question here about uh, may discuss some of the factors that make some ticks not capable of being competent vectors, whereas others they are. Uh, maybe you can chat a little, and that might uh, go into the question of North American ticks. You know, to what extent have, have you maybe experimentally tested? I presume you have um, some of the North American ticks and their competency. Yeah. Um... It's, that's, you know, kind of like the key question for a us. A million dollar question. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's, you know, it's, it's really, I mean, if you look at vector competence, if you come from the mosquito uh, field, you know, like there's the mid gut barrier and the salivary gut barrier and then um, salivary gland barrier and all those things. Um, we see that a lot of ticks, uh, tick species co-feeding on infected animals will acquire the virus. Uh, but in the end, they will not transmit the virus to, to the next host or to human. And I think it's still not really clear. We've, we've infected some uh, North American tick species, and they can certainly acquire the virus. Um, they can maintain the virus. But after a while, they, they lose it, and they cannot trans, transmit it anymore. We just don't know why, where the replication stops. Is it the midgut barrier or the salivary gland barrier? Um, it's, it's, I think many factors come into play and I think that's really needs to be the main focus to understand the, the vector competence. Great, uh, I guess one last question here. Um, I guess for, for those folks interested uh, in CCHF and BSL-4 work but don't have ticks, um, can you just comment on the, the utility of uh, tick cell lines? How, how useful are they? Yeah, that's that's a, a very vex a very excellent question. Um, I really started off using tick cell lines. Um, um, that was my first venture into into the tick world. Uh, the tick cell lines, just based on the way they are generated, um, either from embryonic tissues or from molting uh, larvae or nymphs, are typically in their their origin uh, connective tissue or, or some kind of fibroblastic tissue. And they often don't really mimic um, the, the crucial tissues that we need to mimic in, in our transmission. So there's no cell line that's differentiated out into salivary glands or into hemocele, uh, hemocytes or midgut tissues. And so often when we, when we use cell, uh, tick cell lines, they don't really reflect what we see in nature. So to give you an example, you can take a uh, uh, hema, hemaphysalis uh, cell line infected with Kaisanophorus, and it doesn't work, but if you use a different ex, uh, exodus scapularis, it will infect it. So the, the tick origin often doesn't really uh, mimic the, the, um, what we see in nature. So as, as a result, what we've done um, is we've switched to um, explants. So we just dissect the ticks, we pull out the organs and um, just infect the organs. So the, you know, as organoids, um, even, you know, salivary glands, midgut, um, and, you know, with the help of CDC, we've, we've now uh, have a labeled virus and that really nicely works. You can see the replication in, in those uh, tissues. Great. 
All right, well, very nice talk. Um, I think for the sake of time, we'll push on here to our last speaker. Um, it is uh, Dr. Jessica Spengler uh, from Viral Special Pathogens Branch at the Centers for Disease Control. And uh, Jessica is going to be talking to us about the utility of survivor uh, models of, of human disease uh, in, in animals um, and for use for studies in viral pathogenesis, uh, viral path pathogenesis, transmission, and therapeutics. So over to you, Jessica. Thank you, Dr. Towner. Turning on my video, I hope you can see the slides now. Um, so yep. thank you so much. <laughs> We're good to go? Yeah, you're still in, uh, it, you can see, uh, you, you want to put on presenter view? Sure, 